Welcome to a special masterclass in my summer violin boot camp. Today, I'm super excited to have a very special guest, and I don't think he needs much introduction, but he is Nathan Cole. Nathan Cole is the first associate concertmaster of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the founder of Nate's Violin. And this is a huge honor for him to be appearing in this boot camp masterclass. I have nine eager violinists really excited to play for Nathan. Nathan, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Oh yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. This is this will be fun. Yeah, I see that you're wearing the, the t-shirt that I sent. Thank you so much. Yes. I, uh, now I get the expression. At first I thought it was, you know, just, I thought it was a brand name or something and now I... <laughs> I should probably explain to everyone watching that, so best kind. Well, in Newfoundland, there's a lot of Newfoundlandisms and there's a lot of slang, there's a lot of, uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a dialect in its own. And best kind is a Newfoundland way of saying something is really great. So when we say, Nathan, you're best kind, that means we think you're awesome. So I'm glad you're wearing that. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's the real honor. <laughs> we do have Newfoundlanders in our boot camp, but today we have an honorary Newfoundlander. Let's see. The Newfoundlanders will show up late. That's, that's typical because in Newfoundland we are half an hour delayed in our time zone. How appropriate. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so our first violinist is Lydia Leung, and she is from Bethesda, Maryland. Lydia, what are you going to play? Lydia, I, I remember seeing you on violinist.com among other places but. Yep. Um, I'm gonna play the opening of Ganowski 2 um, through letter D maybe letter E which is basically E is where the upbow staccato ends The pause is always so quiet on these uh, zooms. <laughs> Ima imagine it more. more fun. <laughs> great, great playing. Um, and Lynn, kind of remind me how um, how you'd like to keep track of time. Uh, I have a timer running, uh, nine minutes in total for everyone. I have a seven minute timer, and I'll give you a two minute heads up in the chat. Right now, we're at four minutes and four and a half minutes before okay. seven minutes is up. Yeah, so we got four and a half. Okay. That's that's well organized, thank you. <laughs> um, Lydia, great. I think, um, you know, basically the more compressed things are in time, the more difficult they are generally. 
And, you know, some, sometimes just because of the way a piece is written, we don't have much choice about how that timing is going to go. Um, but I think there are lots of places in this where you could actually expand time just a smidge, not just for technical reasons, but just because I think it would be more satisfying musically. Um, and the effect would be more satisfying for the listener. And, you know, like, what, especially if it's a piece I is the first or second time I'm playing it or something, or if it's an audition, you know, anytime I'm feeling nervous, that's one of the things that can be hardest to do. Is I don't know if you've experienced that mm -hmm. in your life. Um, so it's not just enough maybe to say, to take more time or, or what have you, but I think concrete things that you can do, just for example, taking, uh, making sure that certain notes get vibrato and just basically insisting on playing them at a tempo where they can get vibrato. Oh. Um, like in your second, I think it's the second entrance, but you know, right around there. Um, I would say that there's two notes that I would love for you to vibrate and they're the ones right before the slides. So that one. So they're both D's, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might, might I add even a, a couple more? Because I, I really love how that came out. Uh, and yours were in tune, mine wasn't. The one actually right before you shift down. That one. And then. Each of those little miniature peaks, I think, take enough time that you can vibrate those two. Would you mind the whole phrase again? One other that I liked the pacing that you had for the for the quick stuff. The I would actually want to make sure that you had enough bow mm -hmm. for all of that. I think you don't want to leave anything on the table, so to speak. So go really end to end, and it should actually be easier. You've actually got, you've got more to use in all those notes because by the time you're there, you, you, you're barely at the top third. I, I, I don't remember, um, after the... You, uh, that's a rather long bow that you've got, a rather long up bow. For me, that that's like two notes too many, maybe. I would just change on the E, because then you can use more bow on the top note. Yeah, and as you go on... Again, just I would I would be using whole bows for every bow. Just gives not only about projection but just clarity too. Um, I'm curious just uh, to know: Have you uh, played ever fingered octaves for that scale in octaves? Um, I yes, my fingered octaves are actually not as accurate. Um, I've occasionally done uh, fingered all three, but switching between uh, between one, three, two, four is at that tempo is hard for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I, for the first few at least, if you're gonna do the with all one fours, I would pick a number like you know either the probably the first three or the first four. 
that you can really hear very well. Yeah, I I might do it. I for, I honestly forget how it's printed. Is it printed with two of them separate, or is it just ba oh, and then I, one? I slow. separated them for clarity. I wonder if you might be able to just do that in your hand. Uh, Yeah, so I would start with the burst of maybe it's three or maybe it's four. Or that you feel like you can basically do in one impulse mm -hmm. to start out with. Mm -hmm. I think I'm accelerating to the octaves. So. Okay. Just so I, uh, just so I, time, I'm timekeeper here. We got about 20 seconds left. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and you know, I think different pacings there can yeah. really work. Um, I think your hand is probably capable of as much articulation as you need. I'm not sure that you need the extra. Um, and, and plenty of fine players separate the bows there, so I'm not saying that's wrong. But mm -hmm. I would look first to get the clarity in the hand. Okay. Then make up what you can with the bow. Okay. Yeah, but, the starting with an impulse uh, feels like it helps. Yeah. Good. Well, great. Th thank you so much for playing this. Sounds wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Lydia. You sound great. Got beautiful Thanks. sound, Lydia. I got one. <laughs> hey, good luck on the fiddle. The fiddle camp. Bye. Susanna's next. Susanna Mackenzie Sutter. And Susanna, uh, you're playing Isabella Leonardo Sonata. Yes. Um, Nathan, did you need that score? I sent it, I think, to you. Did you need a... Yeah, you, you got it to me. Thank you. Okay, good. I love hearing something I've never heard before. <laughs> so that's a, how did you find this piece? Um, well, I found it listening to Rachel Ponder, and um, I was also kind of researching music by women composers. So it's actually apparently the first published piece by a woman from oh. 1693, I think it was published. I saw the date. Yeah, yeah that's, that's incredible. Um, you know, 
I think all of us play Baroque music from time to time, and some people make it uh, a life's mission. I'm not one of those, so it's uh, you can't take anything I say as absolutely definitive, but certainly, you know, and as the fact that the figured bass is included here, that's going to be of real importance in, in helping you shape it. And what I would love, because you, you, you've put a lot of thought into the rhythmic freedoms and the ornamentation and everything, and I would love, especially as a first time listener, for you to take me by the hand even a little bit more strongly and lead me harmonically as well as rhythmically where you want to go. Um, I thought like the beginning was really effective because I, I did kind of feel uh, lost. I didn't know what was coming and that's perfectly fine because there's nothing happening in the bass. It's just one long note. Um, but starting in bar six, you know, then there's a bass line and I would really love to feel especially what are going to be the strong beats of arrival. Um, so is that something, do you play keyboard or have you ever played this through with accompaniment? No, I haven't played it through and I'm also not a keyboard player. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 that's fine. Um, one of the, you know, I'm not either. <laughs> I mean, really not. I, I can maybe play these bass notes, but I couldn't uh, play the chords or anything without a lot of prep time. Um, you know, one of the principles that comes up in not only in Baroque music, but in classical and romantic and all that, a lot of times you want to aim for a dissonance, right? And then the more normal or the, the consonant chord could be a bit of a relief. Um, so we go. <laughs> So I would love to hear a little bit more tension right around there before it resolves. So. so that at least, at the very least, you know, every pair of beats or every pair of notes has some kind of relationship that I can make out. Do you, do you mind playing some from bar six again, or you can lead into it from bar five if you want? Sure, I'll go from six. Even just, now there can be some rhythmic freedom, uh, but the bass changes in the middle of your uh, long D. Dun, da, dun, da, dun, pum. And so somehow I've got to feel that, or at least there has to be enough time for it. Right. Uh, go on a little bit. I love that. For every every pair of notes, I could feel and I could hear which one was more important to you. Now, de again, depending on how you think of it, because I've, I've certainly played with people who play Baroque music all the time and, and they've surprised me by which things they think are up for a debate as far as rhythm. Like, <laughs> they'll play anything with free rhythm. <laughs> But this second part, this allegro part to me, um, seems to me to cry out for a little bit more rhythmic structure. structure. Hmm. What I would love is that the 16th notes always pass on to something rather than taking up too much importance themselves. And that when you have, you know, similar to the, the last thing we were talking about, when you've got a dotted quarter, bum, 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 that you wait for that imaginary bass to change. Can you play at 16? Yeah. Yeah. Good. And so 
you know, I've, I've endangered things a little bit because when you play the 16ths more quickly, then it's more difficult to articulate them clearly, right? Or even to get them synced. Sometimes it could be a shift, sometimes it's a string crossing. I think that's worth working toward because I love this kind of rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, There's about 30 seconds. Okay. So, you know, it's not easy to do in these times, I suppose, but the first chance you get, you know, since you love this piece, first chance you get to, to actually play this with someone would be super fun. And it certainly wouldn't have to be a keyboard, uh, cello or even viola could play the bass just as easily. And it just helps once you feel it once how, how the rhythms and the, the harmonies work with your part, it's much easier to make decisions about what you want to do. For sure. Yeah, great job. Great Thanks. playing. Okay, so Jocelyn, you're next. You know, I was just thinking, Susanna, you know what you could do is uh, do what Tim Cantor had kind of suggested. You could record that bass line yourself on the violin and then play it back with yourself. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Jocelyn, are you there? We have Jocelyn Joe. Yeah. And are you playing Sarasate Malagrena? Yes, just like the first half. It's funny, uh, today was actually my first day back at work and it's only going to be for three days where we're just playing a couple one-off programs at the Hollywood Bowl. But the point is that it was the first time having a conductor in so many months and, you know, it's our it's our boss, it's uh, Meister Dudamel. And um, it's funny how quickly you kind of go back into old patterns like, oh, uh, yeah, conductor's getting on us again and you you get defensive and then, you know, occasionally they'll say something and you're like, ah, this is what I've been missing all these months, uh, just for someone to put something in a certain way. Um, so I'm sorry, I probably won't be able to do that for you. <laughs> Gustavo <laughs> did it today for us when he mentioned something in the Mahler 
Fifth Symphony just being a song. And yeah, I, I realized that all these years I was really kind of making a lot more of this particular passage than, than there needed to be. Um, so the point is that for you in the beginning of this, um, yeah, I think it can move a little more quickly. I think it can be, I think it can have a little bit more energy, but I think you might get that all in one package if you do think of it as a song. And okay. it doesn't have to have a, that complicated a message. Um, you know, it's like the same thing twice. So. Now I'm speeding up probably more than I might perform it, but you know, there's, there's energy there. So that, you know, that's the end of the, whatever you want to call it, a cry or a plea or a statement or something. Not, not, to, not too much to be made of the end of that. This clearly has, this is more impassioned somehow, right? And this backing off a little bit. So the, the more that you can think of it in groups, um, you know, we say phrases all the time in music, but honestly, you know, phrases of words, the more that you can group those things together and yes, there are other times where you have to say, okay, eh, now I got to break it down. I got to solve this problem and that problem. But could you play the beginning of this um, and really make each time before you stop or before you've got a long note, make each thing a statement that holds okay. together? Good, good. So, so far, what, what I notice, um, both times you play this, you take a, a decent amount of time. <laughs> And I, you know, one of the, it's a rule that you can break, obviously, but one of the rules of rubato is, you know, what, whatever you give, you have to take, or whatever you take, you have to give. So I think if you're going to take time there, you've either got to move a little bit before or move after. Um, otherwise, uh, you're delaying my, you know, my arrival of, of the crescendo, and I'm not sure why. Um, Similarly, the end of that, you don't have to sustain that note. You know, it's part of a diminuendo and it's the last note of the phrase. It's fine that it's, uh, it transitions to silence. Okay. Do play one more time if you would. Good. And as you go on, you know, part of what I asked for is for this to get more impassioned. Just in the, the little time we have left, I'd love for you to, I wonder, have you ever tried to play really on that other side of the G string, the one that's far away from the D, by the where you're almost painting the wood with rosin over there? Like, will I have to rotate my violin a little bit more? No, do instead I... do it with the, with the arm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I can see, I can see so much daylight there. You're still almost playing on the D string. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's where it actually touches, right? The wood? Yeah. Right. So you can okay. play, isn't that weird? You're almost playing up even though it's a down bow. That's a great feeling to have. It's a very different sound. Okay. Yeah, good. And the last thing I'll say, those are, you're, you've got no shoulder rest, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, so those of us that play with no shoulder rest have to be especially aware of supporting the instrument so that the instrument uh, rises up to join the bow. Otherwise, that bow is always kind of driving the instrument down, and it's a chase that kind of never ends. And the sound is never quite as good as when that violin's pushed up into the bow. Okay. So, yeah. yeah that's, Excellent. that's great, Jocelyn. You sound, that, I immediately, went, Nathan, when you said that uh, a different side of the string, Jocelyn, your sound just went up a huge percentage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Huge percentage. Even on Zoom, I could get a difference. Okay, I definitely remember that. Then. <laughs> That's a nice hack, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jacqueline uh, Redmond, are you ready, Jacqueline? Thank you, Jocelyn. You sounded great. Okay, Jacqueline, are you going to play Franck Sonata? Yes. I'm All right. probably only going to play the first half just for time of the fourth movement. Excellent. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> um, it's, but the, this is one of those that's, it's always kind of maddening to practice by, by yourself <laughs> because it seems so repetitive, just the violin part by itself. And, you know, only when all the pieces are there, th does it make complete sense. Um, but in a way, then it's good practice for for including variety into the phrasing. Um, 
sometimes I think the best thing to do is actually just to figure out how long uh, different units of, of the different, different, how big different pieces of the puzzle are going to be. Um, and you can kind of do it by where the long notes lie. I mean, not it doesn't work in every case, but clearly, like, how many bars would you say the little pieces are in the beginning of, of this movement? Like, the smallest unit that makes any sense. Uh, four? Um, I couldn't hear very well, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, like, the first phrase is about four measures long. Like yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, that answer makes as much sense as the one I was going to give. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not like 16, right? I mean, there, there are pieces smaller than 16 bars that, that would make up part of the story. I was going to say two just because of how the rhythms are, but we could also say four. But the point is that it's not just one long unbroken mass of notes. And so what I missed a little bit when you played was a sense of repose. Um, places where I could exhale, even, even if there was still more song to be sung. Um, So I think to be, to make choices about which of the long notes are you're going to let dwindle and which need to grow. Do you mind playing just as much as I did? Maybe that is 16 or okay. maybe that was just 12. I like that very much. Um, the very first long note for me takes on too much importance. Okay. Um, I love the way you go to the, the C sharp when you start. But I, I feel like that E is just a, it's part of the way down. Let's, let's just tackle a couple of these shifts that are like that. Um, same. You've got another one like that and, and a couple of these that go up to A's. But for all of them, leave yourself time that you complete the shift before you need that note to arrive. So are you on an up bow or down bow for this one? So, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, down bow. Okay. So, and from one to four it is? Yes. So, more or less, your one is going to shift to an E. Yeah. So, you have to leave yourself time and leave yourself bow that you can have a satisfying sound up there when you get there. Mm -hmm. Play just that bow, if you would. Yeah, and then once you once you reach that note, make sure that it has time for a, for a great sound. You got there so soon that uh, I think you surprised yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think that we box ourselves in by going with the bar lines. I, I almost feel like you're you're really set on getting to the next bar line. And so, you know, you don't want to take time enough for the A. See, I think the unit starts ya -da -da -da, yeah. rather than, you know, da -yum -ba. Yeah, you're not separating, but timing wise. Yeah. 
And so the way I would practice it would be to already have arrived and play. Okay. Yeah. Because now I'm making that the unit. Um, I think we've run out of time. Great. <laughs> right. That well, was not great. great <laughs> Sounding beautiful, Jacqueline. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for playing that. You're using so much bow, Jacqueline. I'm envious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I always use too much bow. I forget to save. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the opposite. I use too little bow. Carol Vang is next. Are you ready, Carol? I'm ready. Yay, Carol, what do you going to play? Hi, Carol. Hi. What are you going to play, Carol? Oh, this is uh, the Bach A minor of Sonata the Andante. Perfect. So I tried to improve as much as I could in a week. So we'll see how that went. Awesome. Bravo, great playing. It's nice to hear those uh, double stops. So many of them now are, are really ringing uh, true with each other and and the pitch center, you know, through the thing is uh, really well grounded. So, um, oh, it's a start. sorry, what's that? It's a start. <laughs> no, well, much more than that. The thing that, you know, definitely stands out to me here is the the fact that you know you're bowing based on the rhythm of those accompanying eighth notes 
right? There's that pulse to this whole thing. And so naturally, um, you know, we group sixteenths in the melody by eighth notes too. So a lot of two and two for the sixteenth notes. Um, but really, you know, when you look at this on the page, you know, without any editor's markings, they're all just separate sixteenths in the melody. So um, that doesn't mean mm -hmm. they all should be separated because that you we have to make some kind of choice as to how it goes. But I think what it does mean is that you should play it in such a way that it makes sense as a melody and don't feel bound by separate bows, don't feel bound by two and two. So okay. I think you want to connect parts of the melody that connect. Um, if things come to a, a moment of repose and it's a new phrase, then you can separate in terms of the sound. But I'm hearing... So more connection between the bows. How about uh, playing a little of the second half there? Okay. Hmm. Those are two. So those are two bows that, for technical reasons, there's a little space between. There's a space there. See if you can connect those. Uh -huh. And that one as well. See if, can you play? So that's going to be your next task if you've got your, you know, task list. To go through the whole thing and, and find out where there are spaces between the bows. And in a few cases, you, you might say, actually, that, yeah, that space, I want that one. These others, either I didn't know they were there or whatever. I knew they were there, but I just hadn't gotten around to smoothing them out yet. I think now's the time. Okay. Um, and I would say that you've lightened the bow uh, a good bit so that there are only, you know, it's every couple bars there will be one double stop perhaps where you're still a little far from the bridge and that wants to change the pitch, you know, and mess up the good work that you're doing left hand wise. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the sound in the very beginning, if there might be a chance. <laughs> Now here I think it is great to be far from the bridge so that you can be light. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Did you know that dur during that first bow, now you started out there and I love the sound, during that bow, <laughs> they came in and you matched, you know, you, you added more pressure to compensate, but then the sound got more normal again. Yeah, so the stakes are a little higher out there because mm -hmm. out so far from the bridge, any extra pressure is really going to show up, but I think it would be worth it for you to look for that sound in the beginning and probably in the beginning of the second half too. Um, okay. You've got the stronger, the more concentrated sounds uh, down is those gentler ones, I think, where you can look for um, putting more weight on the pinky side of the bow, yeah, so that it's, you don't have all the, the leverage there. Mm -hmm. Lynn, I, I couldn't tell if that was a sign. Uh, we have 20, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> we, we've talked, have we, Carol, about just 
playing the melody of this without the accompaniment? Yeah, and I'm disappointed that it didn't work like magic. <laughs> I did it quite a lot. Yeah. But it, and then when I put the double stops in, I'm thinking I gotta get the next double stop. I gotta get the double stop. Yeah, I would do it in smaller chunks. So, okay. Um, so just that much. And then compare and see, you know, how close are the two versions. It's a really hard movement. Well, we've talked about the fact that Boston Symphony always asked for that in auditions, so. Yeah. For good reason. Really? Yeah, they used to anyway. Interesting. They would re require that specific movement of Bach. Interesting. Well, that's a gorgeous selection. That's a nice choice, actually. Yeah. But if they start off that with that, then the jitters would really show in that one, wouldn't it? Oh. Yeah, I never had to play it first or anything, but yeah, it was in there. Right. Um, next up, thank you, Carrie. You sounded beautiful. Thanks. Thank uh, we have Josh who submitted a video, so let me screen share. Uh, he's playing Paganini 16. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah? I okay. Can. Bravo again, and I, is Josh here or? Uh, unfortunately, he's not. Uh, he's oh, in a fiddle know. fiddle competition or something right now at the moment. <laughs> Lydia's in it as well. Bravo. Okay. Yeah, I mean sometimes people make a video because they don't trust their internet connection, but then they're they're there. I've <laughs> that's been embarrassing for me. Sometimes I've done these, and you know I'll, I'll talk as if the person's not there for ten minutes, and then you know they'll say, "Oh, actually, I'm here." <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Josh is, uh, his um, image is here. I think he's just running oh, okay. or something. Yeah. So hi, Joshua. Josh, I didn't introduce him properly. Joshua Long. And he's from okay. Hicksville. Hicksville, Long Island. Major oh, okay. I got that wrong, didn't I? Hicksville. Um, well, you know, what I would say is, so there, there are two things that stick out to me right away. One is that I miss all the, the accents or the, you know, the fortes or uh, however you want to refer to them. But... Um, they're an important part of the flavor of this one, and um, I wouldn't want you to wait any longer to incorporate them because, um, especially when things are already moving fast and furious, and you've got all these string changes and everything, um, adding accents can change a little bit where you are in the bow, um, and it's not like a spice that you can just add at the last minute. So you know. The like doing those string crossings with the accents 
is different from doing, doing them smoothly. So I would, you know, I don't think it'll be hard for you to put those in, but you do need to get used to doing them. And it just, um, since you, you can't try it here, basically the way I would form those, you know, I push up my thumb into the leather of the bow um, just before the start of notes like that. So. And it may mean too that the surrounding notes, I take it a little bit easier. Um, so that was the first thing. The second is as much as possible to make sure that you're always on one string. Uh, and that's a tall order in this one that has so much to do with string crossings. But a lot of it is about the timing of it. I find that sometimes when you've got big string crossings, like let's say you've got from D string to E string or something, down bow to up bow, you start to move up when you're only part of the way over. So a pattern like that, I'm finding, I exaggerate now, it was not that much of a mess or anything, but instead it's really, it's got to be the change and then the bow. So, even that one, to make it in tempo, you've got to start moving over almost as soon as you sound that open string. That shift, similar question of timing. I, I found that um, there was the slightest bit of, of noise or uh, uncleanliness there because you were shifting at the start of the note rather than shifting before you needed the note to arrive. These two. Some of that work you can do under tempo, of course. Um, the problem with, because I, I can tell, you know, you've practiced this carefully and you've done some under tempo work. The thing is it doesn't always translate directly to in tempo playing because the motions are gonna be so much faster. So what I would encourage you to do while you're under tempo, um, let's say if we stayed in that same, maybe if we jump, to a place like that. If you're under tempo as I am there, rather than just making the string change slowly because you're playing slowly, make it really fast right at the end. In other words, you're going to hold each note as long as you possibly can before making the string change. That will train those string changes to be really fast, and it will get you listening for the quality of all those notes. Um, how are we doing? Do you, do you have anything you'd like to add, Lynn, since Josh is not here? Uh, oh, well, yeah, I totally agree with the accents, and I think... Um, um, also, I wondered actually, Nathan, what you thought of da 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 da. -de -da -de. I, I actually mentioned to Joshua about um, pulsing the duple 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 duple. I kind of like that actually. With the bow. Yeah. So. Yeah, just a little bit to help. Mm hmm. And I also wondered about the the um, rhythm wise. I heard. Uh, I also didn't hear the third third of the three. Rhythm-wise, rhythm-wise, it felt like it was compressed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I was thinking it might have been in the four, but in oh. any case, yeah, with ba da da da, that the first grouping, but with whichever it was, yeah, wasn't quite 
hearing all of that. Um, and that, that's a dangerous place to speed up with all those half steps. Um, yeah, that's true. I bet practicing it separate, like you, you always um, suggest practicing separate bows, right? Practicing separate bows. Yeah, yeah. To, to make sure that your left hand is even, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think what and I I've told Josh many times I admire his left hand so much. <laughs> it's incredible this the really reach that he naturally has. Yeah, long long fingers. Yeah. Oh, there's the timer. Okay. Well, Josh, I hope that was helpful when you watch it. <laughs> uh, Serena Piercy is next. Hi, Serena. Serena's in St. John's. She's what down the street <laughs> from me. Hi. Hi. I'm Serena. Uh, I'm going to play part of the Mnieszki Concerto number no. 2 in D minor, but I'm going to start from letter L, so near the end. Okay. Thank you. Well, we put you guys together, and we're we're just missing a little bit of development to get the the whole movement. Put you in there. There's three of them playing this concerto, so we could do that. We could make that happen. <laughs> make a montage. Um, so starting right where you did, you know, I've I've actually never played those notes off the string. For me, that would be a little bit too too difficult to execute in tempo. Um, have you ever just played them on the string? Uh, no, I haven't before, but I can try. I mean, I, I give you permission. Uh, it just, it lets you use a little bit more bow. Uh, yeah. Now, a lot of violinists, um, are always and forever just leaning on the top notes of things and they never get the richness. Um, here, I, I almost completely miss the E string, actually. So you can be a little bit more of a, you know, piggish violinist. So get, give us the, the brilliance. If you would, do just the open strings. Yeah, and I like the smoothness, smoothness of how... Uh... So just being in that lower half, I think, is going to give you all the articulation that you need. Um, this the this is one of those things that's almost this and the apostikado. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about how related those two techniques are. They both sort of rely on that reflexive. Um, in both cases, the arm moves smoothly, 
and the finger kind of makes little articulations. Um, so the left hand version and then the right hand version. It's I almost feel like you're holding yourself back with the, with both techniques because uh I knew it. <laughs> yeah, that and that's a great tempo. Um, the only thing you have to do to modify that is it's teenier motions in the beginning, and then the motions get, you know, not linearly, exponentially bigger as you go down. So that by the end, each half step is pretty big. So do the first octave. Do that. Yeah, and you end end up bow just as you did. Yeah, and now do do the second octave. Yeah, so you need. So those have to be bigger. And so you actually only need eight of them. And then uh, so you're going to end on a G. Sorry. And then you finger the rest. Yeah, so th that's the way you can break it up. You've got the first octave, very small motions. And then... And it's a pretty big difference in speed. I'm curious now about the up staccato. If you had no notes to it, uh, just on an open E. Yeah. Again, that's a perfect tempo. <laughs> your left hand needs to move. This, this is a place where your, your right hand gets to set the speed. Your left hand must follow it. Because that's a beautiful stroke. Do that. Uh. Yeah, that's very close. Very close. Your right hand, I think, has the right idea. Um, One more time. Yeah, that left hand just falls behind. So it, and there's no, that's not so fast for your left hand. Your left hand will be able to do it. It just, now you can hear what that sounds like when the bow wants to go and the left hand's just not quite with it. So you can, that's the kind of thing you can slur, you know, honestly, you can find what's the metronome mark, you know, whatever's your good speed for the staccato, find the metronome mark, keep that metronome mark, and then slur. To make sure that your left hand can evenly do that. Um, The little notes need a little of a little bit of articulation. I know they're grace notes, but accent them anyway. Yeah, yeah. that helps as well. The stroke just is in the beginning where you started. Just to use a little bit more bow and have it on the string. Same here. It's just, it's going to carve those notes out there. Try this as the last thing. On the way down, it works beautifully. On the way up, the bow 
wants to rush to the top, so... So that all those notes get, get bow. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Oh, sorry, was that me? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I clicked the, the microphone on mute too soon. Serena, yeah, this, that sounds great. Serena um, won the Junior Rose Bowl in the St. John's Kiwanis Festival. I was so proud of her. And Nathan, I'll have you know, she competed in both piano and violin. Wow. So you could, you could multi-track. You could record the accompaniment. For th that could be a cool YouTube video. Has anybody done that yet with this piece? Serena, you'll be the first. Um, Nathan, I really liked what you said about uh, this is going to be terrible. I, I wrote the, the quote, be more of a piggish violinist. I think that's going to help. But just getting the stroke a little bit glued to the string. Well, we, we can just kind of crassly quote Nathan for tonight. <laughs> I can think of some piggish violinists who play this piece. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you so much, Nathan. And um, we, we are so incredibly grateful. Uh -huh. Yes, we do absolutely think you are the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely so much. Thank you so much from all of us. We're, we're from mostly what? I think we're all from Canada and the U.S. So um, we're sending lots of love to you in L.A. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate that. Um, does anyone else have anything to say to Nathan before we say goodbye to him? This is your last chance. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not last ever. <laughs> yes, hopefully not. I love what you said about how um, accents and dynamics aren't like a spice that you can throw in at the last minute. <laughs> That's a great quote. I wrote that one down too, Nathan. I wrote that down, <laughs> like a spice, yeah. And I was wondering, um, not wondering, I was thinking when you said um, which of those four first down bows in the jig, I thought, oh, this is the perfect time. Now you're allowed to play favorites. So I think we're allowed to play favorites here. <laughs> this is the one time we're allowed to do that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's time to wrap it up, and uh, it is time to say thank you and goodbye to Nathan. Thank you. And well, thank you, Lynn. Great, thank great you great. so much. And thank you, everyone, for playing. You did wonderfully, wonderfully. Um, all right. Have a wonderful evening. It's already evening for me here. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. Getting, getting on toward that for me, too. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nathan. Everybody. Bye.